So Stephen Silverman is on the Marketing Advisory Council. He was recruited by Lynn Hazen. She knows everybody. She knows everybody. So a great connection to have. And we are so excited to have Stephen be our closing keynote of today. He has over three decades of experience in consulting, management, and academics. He's a marketing strategist, branding expert, instructor. He's worked with industry leaders such as Microsoft, Amazon, Mars, Bose, DuPont, and more. Um, so let's give a warm welcome. Well, I know I stand between you and refreshments. I drive fast. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I know it's been a, a really great day so far. Um, and what I'd like to do is end with uh, uh, the beginning of the question. And that is, uh, ask everybody here, what is a brand? Think about it for a second. What I know is that if I ask 10 marketers what is a brand, uh, I get 12 answers, uh, and very few of them are the same. There is a great deal of speaking about brands, but if we talk about what one is, it's not entirely clear. And what we want to do is have enough clarity to know that it's not a logo, and it's not your colors, but it is something else. And what it is is something which resides in the market. It's not yours if you're a brand manager, it's the market's. And so what I'd like to do is say that what we'll answer is that key question, and we'll answer it by saying that it's a brand constellation. Uh, a constellation like the stars in the sky comes together with parts, parts that form a brand. That's an important concept that we'll be looking at. And the idea that you're creating meaning in the market's mind is your responsibility. It's where, as a brand manager, as a manager in marketing, your job is to reach into the market and understand what's in their minds, and your job is also to create that, create that image in what's in their minds. So let's take a look at what that process is like. In a moment, uh, an image will appear on the screen. And when it does, um, a lot of thoughts will come to mind, a lot of feelings will come. And I'd like you to pay attention to what those are and then share them with me in a moment. What thoughts and feelings are coming to mind? Thirsty. Family dinners. Kate. Taste? Sweet? Holidays. Sorry? Holidays. Holidays. Fun. Legacy? Legacy? Holder bear. Holder bear. Holder bear. Fun. Movie theaters. Sorry? Fun. Fun. Movie theaters. All kinds of ideas. But if you notice, how many of you had ideas that were like those that were called out? You didn't mention that. Some people have had similar ideas. And what we know is that when we do the research, we find that there's a great similarity across people in what they think about Coca-Cola. And it doesn't matter what generation you're in, it doesn't matter where you live, this global brand has spent untold billions of dollars uh, doing what it needs to. So why do you know what Coca-Cola is? The answer is because Coca-Cola wanted you to think those things. And Coca-Cola has spent over a century, 135 years, creating that image in the market. And they've done it with a great deal of consistency and a great deal of repetition. So the question is, let's take a look at how Coke creates meaning in the market. I'm looking at Coca-Cola because they are a stellar brand. Uh, they have created meaning in a way which very few other brands have. And I dare say that most of the brands we've heard from today don't have the kind of presence in brains that Coca-Cola has. It takes a long time, and it takes a lot of intention to create that. So let's start with the first look at 
a commercial that some of you who were around 50 years ago will know. <laughs> but the idea is that I want you to pay, is it possible to turn the lights down so you can see this a little bit, please? Thank you. Um, I want you to pay attention how the brand shows up in the ad. So what are they doing to make sure that the brand is there? Let's take a listen. Right. We can just click on it. Okay. At the time this ad was released, uh, the, the U.S. was deeply involved in Vietnam. Uh, there was a global peace movement, and Coca-Cola picked on some critical parts of its brand, bringing people together, uniting people, and focusing on what it means to enjoy uh, when they introduced this. What other ideas did you see? How else did you see the brand show up? Anything? Yeah. Okay, so it was catered to young people. What else? Looking for what Coca-Cola is, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, there's a bit of diversity in here, right? People from all over the planet. So Coca-Cola being inclusive in terms of Coca-Cola's for everybody and ways that you can do that. How about the bottle? Everybody's holding a bottle of Coke. The only way you can find a bottle of Coke in the United States now is if you go buy a Mexican produced Coke and that will give you a glass ball. There are some places where they distribute, especially in the South, the bottles still. Um, what about color? Did you notice the red and white where it was highlighted in there? Coca-Cola is very clear about what it has done to introduce the images and language that goes into a brand. Um, I'd like to share another example with you uh, to see how Coke has done it here. This is Open That Coca-Cola Taste. Open That Coca-Cola Taste, which is uh, presented, uh, tell me how it tastes. This is Tyler, the creator, who was just at Coachella a couple weeks ago and who is like exploding in lots of different ways right now. He's all over the place. He just designed a line of shoes. Um, the idea is how do we go from generation to generation and not lose the brand? How do we make sure that people who are in uh, different stages of life are connected to it. So he focuses on the taste. Coca-Cola emphasizes taste. It was one of the things that came out when we asked what comes to mind. Coca-Cola talks about its taste. And Tyler, the creator, says, tell me how it tastes. Tell me how it tastes. Good, good, good. So listen to it and see what you hear. So again, watch for the brand in this video. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ah, <laughs> how does the brand show up here? Ways that you saw the brand in the ad. Anything? Yes, take the policy visuals that you can see. Well. It is young, but what else is it? You saw a generational presentation, right? So you can't just uh, say we're going to appeal to Gen Z or Gen Alpha or whatever's coming next, right? The, this brand can't afford to do that. And so it's looking at how do we make sure we're connected to everybody. Well, what has this brand done? And what have other brands done uh, to move things forward in their success? What you see here is what I call a brand language. That visually and uh, auditorially, uh, verbally, you see the brand consistently show up. Whether it's the bottle that you all recognize, or knowing that, as we heard before, you drink it with family, or that you, if you're Barbie, you wear a red and white dress in late 70s when this ad was when that uh, uh, execution was done or this sign drink coca-cola i don't care where you are in the world you'll see this sign just like this in languages far and wide and it's a product that you drink with friends and different types of coke and we heard about the polar bears polar bear wearing his red collar on his white fur and often seen with santa claus dressed in red and white introduced originally in the early 1930s by Coca-Cola. Now, Santa wore all kinds of stuff before that, uh, colors, uh, blue, green, depending on the country you were in. Now, I went to Thailand a few years ago, Santa wears red and white, period. So the idea that you've created this brand language has been based on more than a century of consistency. And the idea that we all share a language of Coca-Cola is very important. Because what that has what has happened for that to occur is that Coca-Cola has created an object in your brain. They've purchased space over the last 135 years in all of our brains. There are billions and billions of people on this planet. I venture to say that very, very few of them don't know Coca-Cola. And in doing that, they did it by introducing this object. And it's important to understand that as brand managers, we are responsible for an object. Because objects are what we pay attention to in our world. Our brains see the objects around us right now. All of the things you see in this room, all of the things that you are looking at are objects that you recognize in this environment. And our brains are very good at it. We're pattern matching machines. We look for familiarity things that we can trust, or things that we need to be afraid of. And we will act based on what we know about that object. So if it's something that we feel comfortable with and we're attracted to, we may choose to be with it. If it's something we don't understand, we're confused about, we probably won't give it the, the time of day to figure out whether or not it's something we should appeal, that should appeal to us. Instead, we'll ignore it and move on. Because all we're really trying to do when we assess an object is determine whether it's something that we care about or we can ignore. And so that's something that we see with brands. A brand is an object. It turns out that it doesn't have to be physical. It can be intangible. That your brain will treat it very similarly. And 
we need to know what an object is if we're going to manage one, because that's something that we have to put into our plan. So if this is an object, a mug, and this is another one, and this is another one. Uh, these are all objects, and you recognize what this is, um, because they all have characteristics of mugness. They have indicators that tell you this is a mug. They have straight sides, a flat bottom, a handle, an open top. They share these characteristics. And so it's something that even though they're not identical, you can classify them all as objects. And so the idea that how that happens is that each of those individual parts gives you information. But you don't sit there and say, oh, there's the handle, there's the bottom, and so forth. You assess it as one unit, a whole. And that's where we want to go, is to understand that wholes are formed from parts in our world. So when you look at all of the brands that you've seen in your life, there are parts of that brand that get exposed to you in different ways. Your job is to completely assemble them. To show you how this works, I put this up on the screen. Does anyone recognize what this is? Just raise your hand if you do. We have a few who do. I'll give you a little context. You know what this is? Mm -hmm. All right. Orion's Bell. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this is in the middle of the constellation of Orion. And uh, it might be easier to see it this way if you're not familiar. Most people who look up in the sky see these three stars and assemble them as a unit. They are not seen as three separate stars. And when you look at the whole constellation, what's going on is just a bigger version of that. Why do we have constellations? We talk about them because individual stars are just that, individual points of light. But what you have when you connect those stars into an image is a whole unit that assembles itself together and now becomes something that you can see. And once you see it, very unlikely that you're going to be able to unsee it. You won't see three individual stars anymore. You will see Orion's belt. And the reason that happens is because our brains do it very, very well. They are looking for ways to hold meaning in, the, in very molar ways, very systematic ways to make sure that we get all the information we can at one go. So what holds the meaning we create? It's constellations of the mind. So like we have them in the sky, what's happening in your brain is the similar thing that's happening up in the sky. And that is that individual parts are becoming a whole. So why do we have constellations of the mind? As I mentioned, we have no choice. This is how we think. We think in parts. In neuroscience, we talk about networks of associations. Whether you're talking about the physical brain, where neurons connect with neurons, or you're talking about a metaphor which says uh, we think in these networks and we use ways, mechanisms, tools to help us understand what's in the network of association. And in psychology, we know that uh, Gestalt says the same thing, parts become whole. And fortunately for all of us, this happens almost entirely subconscious. If we had to sit there and look at a mug and assemble it piece by piece, we'd be frozen. We wouldn't be able to make a choice. And this is, when you put a brand together, the whole idea is to get people to recognize what this is, what this object is, and choose it. Be familiar enough with it, be attracted enough to it, to be able to make a choice. That choice is going to be almost entirely unconscious. So no matter how much we work as marketers to try and get people to think actively, that's not gonna happen. This is going to happen almost entirely without anybody taking the effort to do so because it's happening all the time. Just look at anything that you see when you are in or leave this room, you will know that you are not assembling things piece by piece. So we create constellations constantly. We've said that objects are these networks of associations, and they can be tangible like a mug or intangible <laughs> like an idea or a brand. And brains treat those things similarly. So it's our job to create the thing that has a constellation of meaning. That's our job. We have to establish what that meaning is for people. 
And when we have that for a brand, I call that a brand constellation. And this is based on a lot of work that's been done, and I've referenced some of the psychological stuff. But what's important to understand about brand constellations is whether you intend to have a brand or not, you have one. Because people will fill in the blanks. They will look at what you offer, and if they don't have the information that they need about what you offer, they will make it up. So if you think that only AI is hallucinating, you got it wrong. A lot of people make wrong inferences about brands because brands aren't doing a lot to help them understand what they need to be thinking in the first place. The other things to think about is that you are bringing about a, that assembly and that our job, job is to create a brand constellation. So what is a brand constellation? It worked from objects into networks, and now we're saying we have this thing called a brand constellation. What is that? Well, I did some research with a couple of colleagues at uh, Washington State University when I was there, and we did uh, we did extensive research and found that um, there are parts of a brand, just like there are parts of a mug or any other object that can be disaggregated, you can do the same thing with a brand. And we know this because when you ask people uh, what thoughts and feelings come to mind, when you think of a brand, which I just did with you five minutes, 10 minutes ago, you can pull up that information. Thoughts and feelings that are inside of you and connected can be assessed by, we ask people to tell us for each of those thoughts, is, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Is that a good feeling or a bad feeling? So we can assess the attitude of the strength. And what we did was we compared the top brands in a category to the second brand in a category. We were only looking at two great brands, Coke and Pepsi, okay, Apple and Dell, whatever it was. And the idea, what, what question we were asking is, does the network of associations that you have in your head reflect the fact that that brand performs so well on sales or on market share? And what we found was that in every case, the top brand had a much higher appreciation in the market, a value in the market, based on what was in people's minds. And what we did to see that was we used a tool called, called an affinity diagram. This is just an example of a code one that we created. And what you do is you take qualitative data, like people's answers to the thoughts and feelings question, and you aggregate it into groupings. What are similar ideas? And, you add, and then you uh, name each of those categories, name each of the groupings. And what we found was that there are eight categories in a brand. Eight categories that provided a mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive way of allocating all of the thoughts and feelings. And so the question we had then was, well, what is it about? What are, what are these eight categories? And I'll share them with you, and they'll be familiar. What I want you to know before you see all this is knowing what they are isn't the end of the story. It's you have to make an effort to make sure you fill up each of these eight buckets with information, with experiences, with relationship. The product, what is the core offering? What's that core need that people are going to get satisfied? How do they access it? What is the place in the market? What is the price, the total cost that I have to engage here, whether that's through time or effort, or just transferring cash, or promotion. What is the story that you want to tell about your brand, the way that we saw Coke telling the story the minute ago? We said, oh my God, the four Ps. People are using these categories subconsciously to fill in the blank about what this is. Now remember, this isn't what's actually happening in your brain. I want you to know, I didn't do that kind of research. What I said was, is this a reasonable way of organizing the information so that we know what it is we're trying to create? Four other, four other dimensions. Category, what place, where should I find what you offer? If it's in the beverage category, or soft drinks, where do I look and find that? And who are your competitors? Who are your direct competitors? People who have a very similar offering to something that you have, uh, and avoid your indirect competitors. So it's Pepsi versus water here. 
because the experience that we're trying to fulfill is one of thirst. And the same thing for company. We heard a lot of talk about this today, which is what does the company stand for? People look for understanding what does it mean to get something from this particular organization? What's their ethos? What are their values? What are their beliefs? What do they do to fulfill those in the market? And lastly, customers. I put it last, even though that's the first thing that they introduce to you in marketing, is everything revolves around the customer. Here what we're looking at is a customer's association with the product, personal and uh, engaging relationship. What is it that I'm supposed to do with this product? When people use terms like, I have it for a party, or I have it with my family, these are words that connect me to the consumption space and the product. And so these are the four C's. Now you may have three C's, five C's, 10 C's. This is what came out of our research was the four P's and the four C. And together, these parts form a brand. People will aggregate this information to form a holistic view. So how does that look in Coca-Cola? Product actually breaks out into three pieces. So people want to know, what do I use? What's the core need? What is the fundamental reason I'm going to purchase this product? Here, with Coca-Cola, we know it's thirst. They've told us that uh, and said that over and over again. And he was you know, saying it, uh, Tyler, the creator, telling us that if you're thirsty, open one of these up. Here is a variety of types. If this is a car, it might be trim packages. In this case, it's packaging uh, various versions that you can purchase. Product related. What is it that I'm going to experience? Effervescence, sweetness, uh, caffeine, things that we know are related to the product. Together, these help to form an understanding of what is the thing. And I know that a lot of you who are in uh, startups, that's what you focus on. So startups that I've worked with uh, generally have a good idea, not always, have a good idea of what their product is. Because that's what they do all day long, is focus on the product. But not knowing what the other parts are, you may not intentionally and create all of them for people to form a complete understanding of your brand. In the case of promotion, we saw the examples of how over 50 years, they used the same imagery and very similar ways of conveying the brand in color and language and so forth. And they've been doing it for so long. Placement, what is the placement for Coca-Cola? Highly intensive, right? And we saw it in that second ad. You can get this at a convenience store. You can get this practically anywhere. And you're going to pay a low price total cost because it is easily accessible in many places. And the cost overall, not very high and oftentimes discount. What category are we in? Is it soft drinks or beverages? I need to know what aisle I'm going to if I'm going to show up in the right place. Aisles can be in your head, okay? This is a categorization process. You're just looking at where do I need to find this and things like it. And who are the competitors that I'm going to be choosing from? Assuming that they're direct competitors like Pepsi. And what we got was Pepsi and everybody else. We got a bunch of ideas here. But clearly, Pepsi is not. Company related ideas. These are ideas like this is an American company, it's an international company, it's a leader. We heard things like that. And uh, today you would see also uh, they, used, they used recycled plastic in their bottles or they have a plan for, for in investing in recycling. Consumer related, as I was mentioning, it's things like, how does it affect me? So I use this when people are together, when I'm with friends, when I'm with family, at certain events. We got things like, uh, when I'm on campus, I drink Pepsi because Pepsi owns our campus, but I drink Coke when I go home because my parents always have. The idea that this is the brand constellation is important. Because if you're not managing all of these things the way Coca-Cola and any number of brands do, you are leaving yourself open to letting competitors or somebody else define what goes into these categories. So there has to be an effort, an intentional effort, to make sure that people know this stuff on your whatever it is that you're offering. And so that's where making sure that you have the right strategy in place is what we want to focus on. 
So I asked the question at the beginning, what's in your brand constellation? And we said that a brand is an object. So that we have to think about this is something that people are going to assess and see just like they see every other object. There's a lot of competition for what you said. There's a lot of competition for what we have to pay attention to. And knowing that it is an object means that we have to treat it like one. And that means we have to give it those places in people's minds that they can assemble it and bring the constellation of meaning together. So that the brand holds that meaning the way a constellation in the sky tells a story or guides navigation. You know what to do with it. Importantly, when you have an object, you need to know how to act toward it. And you need to know how it's going to act toward you. And that means that you have a relationship with that product. That last piece where we talked about customer and related things, that's a relationship dimension. When people ask, well, what about context, right? Context is down there in when do I consume this? When is it appropriate for me to buy this? Things like that. And we know that there are eight stars in a brand constellation because we've done that research and said, okay, this makes sense. Is it convergent with other things that we found? And we found that it does. That there are groups of ideas that when you have an object that you must present to people in order for them to understand what that is. So if you're responsible for managing a brand, your job is to create this consistent network of associations in people's heads. You must own their brain. It's not a trivial practice, and it's not something that ethically we take for granted. You're inviting yourself into somebody else's brain space and understanding space. And so providing them with the knowledge that they need is offering to them. They need to receive that. And you need to create the context for them to be able to get the value from it. Because brand managers are the ones who are responsible for shaping brand constellations. Whether you're doing that today or you're looking at where you're going to go. For those of you who've started your own companies, what is in your network of association? And you find that out by asking people in part by asking. And so you need to sit down with your customer and find out and listen to her and find out what is in her mind. What is the feeling that she gets? So whether it's what we were just listening to for the uh, beauty products, it doesn't matter what your product is. You need to understand what builds that relationship, that experience for people. And that comes from building brand constellations. And that's your responsibility. You are here uh, as a brand manager, but your job is to understand the thoughts and feelings in the markets because that's what the brand is. There is nothing, no way of defining brand without defining where it resides. It resides in the mind of the market. And our job is to make sure that we prepare that mind and allow it to receive the information and experiences that we create. Then you need to understand, based on what that is, where are we missing it? Because we have an understanding of what that brand should be. What should people be thinking about your brand? We didn't talk about Dove. I'll use that. But what should Dove represent in the mind of the market? They've been at natural beauty for 20 years. What does that mean? They've done it consistently for a long time establishing what that is, even in the face of competitors like those that you mentioned and those that were sitting here. There is a path that you must set and follow. You get to do what Coca-Cola has done, take a step off the path and add some information. Don't take too many steps off the path because what you do is just confuse people. And when people are confused about an object, the only thing they assess is, is it dangerous? Do I have to run away from it? If it's not a threat, I'll just ignore it. I'll just ignore it. Because there's one over here that's a lot clearer to me as an alternative. And so what we're creating in those market, in the market's mind is a clarity and an understanding and a desire. Because choice can only come from knowing what it is that you are acquiring. And that is your role as a manager. 
we heard from Stephen this morning uh, about Patagonia and others that are B Corps. I bring in this piece right now because I want you to see how they present the brand. They've been doing it, as I said, tells you for 50 years. And as Stephen noted, they recently, relatively recently, essentially divested themselves of ownership, mm -hmm. the owner of the company, and gave it to a, an organization which is responsible for shepherding it and making sure that the profits which come from it get distributed, not just to owners who own uh, two percent of the company, uh, and the, that those are the investors today. And this investment or this uh, private organization is now owns ninety eight percent of the co of the company, and is responsible for shepherding the future, which is to save the earth. So take a look at how this campaign approached this brand. If the first 50 years were an experiment to prove that a business could be responsible and successful, and vibrant and financial, and level, turns out it's not just possible, it's profitable. So it's time for a new experiment because the problems we face are more dire than ever. So what's next? What's next is resilience. What's next is turning capitalism on its head. And putting our money where our mouth is. What's next is thinking. It's human. It is finding joy. They do need help. You know, you think life is just one big playground. <laughs> yeah. It is. Oh, What's next is unstoppable. No peace, baby. There is a founder that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Not a lot of people understand how serious we are about saving the planet. I'm dead serious. What's the brand? All that that's wrapped up in you don't have to disaggregate this into its parts to know what the whole is about Patagonia uh, prices its products high relative to others in the market it has a very exclusive distribution channel and it conveys that what we are about is something more than the products that we sell they uh, started out as a company with the founder here, you just saw, uh, making his own climbing gear. And then friends of his said, can you make some for me? And that's how he started. He never intended, what we heard this morning also, never intended to go into business. In fact, this has nothing to do with business per se. It's about one thing, save the planet. And from the very beginning, that's what they were about. From the earliest time in the early 1970s. That's what they were able to get today. So it's something that you should think about, which is what is your brand in the mind of the market? And if you haven't touched on all of those dimensions, or if you have, but you don't know what people have in their minds about what you provided, you're at a disadvantage. It's about knowing what people are thinking. And no AI tool is going to find that out. No amount of scraping the internet. You're going to have to sit down and watch people and listen to them and see for yourselves, hearing from them, whether or not that brand that you think you put out there is what they have in their minds. All of these brands and 
really hundreds more like them have done a stellar job of creating their brands. I don't think any of them set out to make sure that they communicated the four P's and the four C's. But they have done it. And we know it because when we go back and we ask people, tell us what comes to mind, that's what we get. Investing in the brand the way these companies have and countless others is great. But if you've got a small problem, or if you've got an existing product that already has some meaning, you better check into what it really means. Yes, market research is important, but there may be any number of ways that you can learn. It's about going out and saying, what's in the mind of the market? And understanding that there's a universe of meaning out there, and it's your job to find out what it is. So what is a brand? I asked this at the very beginning. And I said that you could get 10 people to give you 12 answers. I wasn't joking. We'll do it right now when you're done. Go around to the people you're standing with over a drink and say, what's a brand? Well, now we have 100 people who can say one thing. It's a constellation. It's a constellation of meaning. And it's our responsibility to manage that. So I encourage you to reach for the stars and go for it. Thank you very much. And I appreciate it. We'll be testing you at happy hour. I hope everybody pays attention. We're close to time, so we'll take two questions and then we're going to close it out. Um, I saw that. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is, when a brand becomes damaged, how do you go about repairing it for site conservation? Yeah, this is really important. Brands get damaged all the time. Um, the, the one that comes to mind, which is sort of the classic case, was uh, 1982 when Tylenol had to deal with its packaging problem. And Tylenol's packaging was opened up because we didn't have uh, protection on it at that time. And somebody put poison in there, someone who was never found. What did they do? They turned to their ethos. And what they did, because it's about the company's choice. This isn't something you go and you just say, oh, well, we'll put some protection on the packaging, now, which is what they did. That was the right solution. But that's not what they did that said. They cleared every shelf on the planet of all Tylenol. Every package was sent to the garbage. And they paid all of their retailers and wholesalers for it because they needed to protect that brand and show that you can trust us. That's the number one thing that you have with a medical uh, offering. Can you trust it? And so in the ca this case, what they did was they turned to themselves and said, if this is about us making a choice, a business decision, and that's how we're going to convey what we do, no matter what it costs us. I did it cost them. Oh, yeah. And they saw a dip in their products. But today, they still own that price, that place on the shelf, which they easily could have never returned. So I don't know if that gets at everything you're getting for, but the idea is you've got to look at that part of the brand where you can make a difference in what that uh, injury has been. And in this case, they decided that they would go for uh, being able to treat people to the safety that they wanted to have. And that's what they focused on. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned that the are not understand the cost of payments. Do you think that we can, that we'll fully be able to determine how the market sees it on? Especially as we are world changing every day, there's new things coming. So, and again, um, how does that affect us? What is the next to us as an actor that we can understand? Yeah, it's an endless path, and everyone in here who manages a brand or has touched a brand knows that, and those of you who have a chance to do that in your career will find out. Um, what, what we need to do it, to understand, first of all, is accept that we won't understand. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox, 
but we will get indicators as to what people understand about our brand. We will do the research. We will ask qualitatively and quantitatively questions that we can get answers to. But the only way we understand is by continuously staying in touch with what the product, with what the market is thinking, watching them, following them, engaging with them. When I was at Microsoft, one of the things that we spent our time on was trying to understand how to manage the Microsoft, what was then the Office brand. Uh, what was a problem? And the reason you have Microsoft 365 today is that Office conveyed officeness. And we got tons of that when we interviewed people. Where do you use this product? I use it at work. Problem was that people were not distinguishing between their time at work and their time at home anymore. And so what we found was they're excluding the product from decisions that they might otherwise use it for. How do I manage and create a birthday invitation? How do I do any of a number of things that I might do on a daily basis? We wanted to understand that. And so we spent a lot of time with people looking at what is in their mind and how do they use that. We did a lot of qualitative research and it was about staying, staying really close. It took them 10 years to go from Office to 365 for a whole bunch of technological reasons primarily. But knowing what's in the mind of the market is the manager's job. And so I can't say enough about how much it's how important it is to to do market research the old school kind and this kind that we heard about today because i think it's not one or the other it's doing it all and the, the answer that i always give you know people will say well, what happens if you don't do it all i say is you better hope your competitor does not because they will know they will understand your customer better than you do and that will put you at a very big disadvantage. So it's knowing that and continuously doing it that's going to help you build that story to understand. Are you good? That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. I thought this was such a great way to close out the day because we've seen so many businesses and great examples.